Agents Podcast. Welcome back, Lab Code Nation, to another episode of the Lab Code Agents Podcast. And uh, we're going to get uh, like super uh, interesting today. I, I couldn't think of a better word than that. And let me tell you why. Uh, we're going to put on our, you know, CSI hats, if you will. And I'm sure this guy's so tired of hearing those stupid analogies, but I did it anyway. Uh, because he has a background in forensics and interrogation. And you might be thinking right now, what the hell does this have to do with real estate? Well, let me tell you what we're going to talk about today, because through his skills and through his backgrounds, he has now evolved to where he actually works with people to help them become better listeners, better interviewers, or more persuasive, like let's just say you're trying to win over a listing, and we are going to bring all of that together today. This is going to be fun. It's going to be different, and that's why I'm excited about it. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Michael Reddington of Inquasive uh, to the podcast. Thank you very much, Jeff. It's great to be here. Awesome. So let's start here, Michael. First of all, uh, tell us a little bit, and maybe we should, you know what, we'll do this at the end. We'll do Inquasive at the end. Let's do you first. Uh, tell us about who the hell you are, what kind of led you into the field of, well, I, I just be, frankly want to know what you did before what you're doing now, and then what led you to where you are today. I appreciate you asking. My life has been a series of accidental job acceptances, one after another. So I started out as an eighth grade special education school teacher and really thought that's all I would ever do. I got talked into trying the financial industry by some friends who you know, wanted to see me make the money they were making. Lasted two years, one month, and two days before deciding I couldn't do that for one minute longer and ended up juggling part-time jobs while I went back to get a business degree. And one of those jobs was a part-time investigations job. And it really was just another job to help me pay my bills. But one thing led to another and eventually got promoted into a management position where one of my main responsibilities was to identify employees who, as I like to say, were making regrettable decisions. And I had the opportunity to sit down with them and, and ask them to tell me the truth about that. My early success there got me into some additional interview and interrogation training. And that is where, you know, as they say, the clouds parted and the rainbow sprung and the sunshine came through and the angels sung. And I thought, this is for me. And the, maybe the best analogy I can use is, you know, you meet an auto mechanic and you say, hey, dude, how'd you get into cars? And yeah, they might have been interested in their father's hot rod or their grandfather's old truck, but they had to get inside it and tear it apart and figure out what made it work. And for me, that was the case with interview and interrogation. It was nice to know some techniques that, you know, I could trip out of an elevator and 60% of the time that technique was going to get me to the truth. But I really wanted to understand what does it take to sit down with a complete stranger with completely opposing interests, goals, fears, and motivations where there is no such thing as a middle ground and cause them to share the majority of the truth in a very stressful and sensitive situation. So unpacking that led me to achieve my certified forensic interviewer designation, which then got me recruited by the world's leading non-confrontational interview and interrogation training organization. And in the decade I had with them, conducting interrogations as a contractor and traveling the world, teaching federal agents, police officers, private sector, human resources, everybody, how to get the truth with, get this, rapport based techniques, I came to two really important realizations. The first one is that the very best leaders and the very best interrogators capitalize on the same two core skills, vision and influence. And the second one is that believe it or not, the cognitive process that interrogation suspects experience when they truthfully commit to saying I did it is essentially identical to the cognitive processes that customers experience when they commit to saying, I'll buy it, and employees experience when they commit to saying, I'll do it. So with those realizations in my back pocket, I transitioned away from a full-time interrogation career. I still dabble in it because I think it's fun, but now I spend the majority of my time working with executives and business professionals, teaching them how to apply strategic, ethical, observation and persuasion techniques with our discipline listening method. So there's no waterboarding? Oh, that's the advanced class. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no waterboarding. I love it, man. So, okay. So this is a very natural progression of a career. PE teacher to financial planner to investigative work to certified forensic interviewer. I mean, I don't think anyone would ever draw it up that way. That's uh, fascinating. 
I love it. And so here, before we get into the business side of things, I always like to get personal with people. And I'm going to be honest, I, I got to know, you've got to have a story that you can share that's entertaining or an example of somebody that you interrogated that is fun to hear about. So what do you got? It always comes down to, you know, what's fun for me versus what's fun for other people. What's fun right? for the masses? What's fun? Well, just tell it. Yeah, fine. What's fun for you? Tell us, tell us a story about something that happened. Cause most of us don't, I, I think there's listeners right now thinking interesting, never had a conversation with somebody like this before. So tell me more. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a couple that jump to mind. Um, but again, they're, they're more fun for me, I think, than they are necessarily for other people. Um, but I think the one that jumps out, and I'll keep the story short, so I try to get the entertaining context in without completely jeopardizing the entire conversation we're looking to have today. But long story short, several years back, I got a phone call. They called my former company. I happened to be the guy that answered the phone that day. So we got the phone call, and essentially it was a Fortune 500 national company that I'm willing to bet all of your listeners have seen a commercial for at some point, they're nationwide where their president of consumer marketing was retiring. So they were gonna do the natural VP becomes president, director becomes VP. But in the prep process, they begin to hear rumors or heard rumors that their director had been committing some fraud and had been stealing some things. And that obviously was a big problem. So they call us, I answer the phone and they say, can you come out here Thursday? That week I actually could. And they say, okay, good, here's the deal. They tell me what they wanna do promotion wise. They say, if you can get him to confess, we're gonna fire him. If you can't, we're gonna make him vice president. <laughs> awesome. Oh. So I ask them if they're gonna do an investigation and they say, no, that's why we called you, even better. So, you know, people that clearly don't understand how these things are supposed to work. So I go out and have a conversation with the guy. And again, using good techniques, taking a rapport-based approach, letting the conversation come to us, strategically did, working through it. Did he know why you were there? He eventually did, yes. So he yeah. didn't in the beginning. You go sit down with somebody and they have no idea. How did you introduce yourself? Like, What are you there to do? Yeah, I generally introduce myself in those scenarios in the private sector as somebody that's been brought in by human resources and I'd really appreciate their assistance. I've found that if you stand in front of somebody and say, my name is Mike, I'm a certified forensic interviewer and I have a few questions, you can kiss the rest of that conversation goodbye. Um, and generally speaking, if somebody has either been involved, witnessed, or was a victim in an incident, they connect those dots really quick. So there's no need for me to confront them with that at the beginning of the conversation. So we go through the conversation. He ends up confessing to, I'm assuming the majority of the fraud that he committed. I'm sure there's a few things he held back so he could feel like he got a win. That's fine with me. I got more than I needed so I can feel like I got the win too. But as I was walking into, and I believe you're in the Midwest, uh, as I was walking into the interview room, one of their investigators literally grabbed me by the shoulder and said, there's one more thing. Oh, gee, really? He said that, um, Previously, I think it was a couple of years ago, prior to when I did the interview, they had received some autographed Jim Tomey pictures. And for any of your listeners that don't know, he's a Hall of Fame baseball player that had several stops around the Midwest. He's originally from Illinois and apparently a good guy. So they had these pictures that they were going to auction off for charity. Well, they went missing shortly after they got them. And word on the street was this dude had taken them home and hung them up in his kid's bedroom. But nobody had ever thought to confirm that. So not only am I now going into this whole thing about the fraud, but now they're asking me to get the Jim Tomey pictures back. So yeah, whatever. So after I get the dude to tell me about, I'm assuming the majority of the fraud that he committed, we're about to transition to the point where I ask him to write it all down for me so I can turn it over to his HR team and they can give him the good news that he's now free to go apply for another job. <laughs> I just look at him, I say, hey man, I really appreciate you being so professional with me and having the conversation with me today, can I ask you one more question? He says, yeah. I said, how many days will it take you to bring those Jim Tomey pictures back? His eyes get about as big as silver dollars. And he goes, dude, I'll bring it back tomorrow with the Mike Ditka footballs. <laughs> Nobody knew he stole the autograph Mike Ditka footballs. So like for me, that's a funny story. And there's pieces I didn't tell you about kind of his attitude and background and things that he had previously said and whatever. But for me to take a look at where the investigation started, how the organization had quote unquote attempted to handle it before I got there, his original attitude, and then getting the free Mike Dicka footballs at the end. Like to me, it's little things like that, that, that make my day when they happen. So that, that might not be the most impressive example, but it sticks in my mind as one of the more entertaining. You know, I'll be honest, uh, and I'm not a, a spring chicken, but you know, I've been around the real estate world for 21 years. 
Uh, I didn't even know this kind of stuff existed. I didn't know companies hired forensic interviewers to basically, you know, to give lie detector tests, essentially, right? I mean, I, I didn't even know that existed. What, is, what does a company pay for something like that? Well, I guess it depends on the company. It depends on the investigation. And as a, a certified forensic interviewer would be like a CPA for accounting. And I know there's designations for realtors as well. I don't want to throw them out there and get them wrong. But it's, it's a professional designation of expertise. So being a certified forensic interviewer isn't necessarily a career in and of itself. It's a designation that investigators can earn in order to prove their level of expertise and capability. So I worked for an organization that we were basically interrogation instructors and contract interrogators. And we're, I mean, there's several of those. We weren't the only one. So by the time people would call us to get involved with their investigation, the dumpster was fully engulfed. <laughs> like, it was very, very rarely that somebody called us proactively. We think something's going on. Can you help us figure it out? It was usually, we heard this happen. We tried to fix it. We screwed it up. It's been a couple of weeks. You think you can come in and fix it? That's generally the, the type of situation we found ourselves in. That's fascinating, man. So I can't be the only one here that when the word interrogation comes to mind, I immediately think of military. That's yeah. what I think of or police work, right? Yeah. Um, so it's fascinating to know that this is there's so much more than that. And this is really a corporate thing, uh, which is a perfect segue, because honestly, um, and I, I hate to say it, I could spend this entire conversation just having you tell me stories um, and I would be perfectly entertained. But I don't think that's why our listeners are here. Maybe there's a handful that are clapping their hands and agreeing with me right now, but uh, let's help them. Let's help our real estate agent, our real estate audience apply this, which probably never crossed any of their minds and now apply it to business. And, and here's the thing, Michael, now that you're, you've got experience in the real estate world, you know, you, I guess you said executives and I'm sure you have some experience with real estate. Yes, I do. You probably know that the leaders of our industry, the brokers that are teaching these realtors, they, they're they not very good at persuasion. And that's who you're being essentially taught by. I can probably be one of them, raise my hand and say, A, I probably wasn't taught by somebody who's nearly the level of you. Uh, and B, now I'm the one teaching it. Uh, and I, I'm just a pretty good talker. I don't know that I have a certain skill set. So where does the conversation go from here when somebody in, in the professional world says, all right, how do I apply this to business? Yeah. So really what we talk about is using the truth to our advantage. And the truth, there can be multiple truths in any given conversation. So when we think about in my, I do have experience working with various organizations in the industry, but I'm also an outsider and I want to be very clear on that. I do have some perspective in that it appears, and correct me everywhere I need to be corrected. You're never going to hurt my feelings. It appears that the, to potentially use a risky phrase, traditional model of negotiation or winning clients or you know finalizing sales is based on taking positions. This is what we want for this property. Well, this is what we're willing to pay you for this property. Here's why we think it's not worth this. Here's why we think it's more than that. Okay, let's wear each other down, maybe throw in some threats. Well, there's other properties we're looking at. Well, there's other people that are interested in this property. And somebody gives in at the end. Mm -hmm. And depending on how that process goes, maybe one party feels good about it. Maybe no party feels good about it. Maybe they both do. So really what we try to do when we talk about applying, you know, for lack of a better uh, phrase, lessons from the interrogation room into the business world and specifically to the world of your audience is the first thing we do is we got to stop and think, okay, any engagement that I participate in, any conversation that I join, how can this conversation get me one step closer to achieving my long-term goals? And I'm assuming that for most of the realtors listening to this, assuming that's the majority of your audience, the long-term goal isn't selling this property or closing the purchase of this property. The long-term goal is building their reputation, building their client book within their area of responsibility, or if they represent a national company, whatever it might be. So really from hello, it is how do I interact with everybody I interact with in order to create the best possible reputation and the best possible opportunity for long-term success based on how I engage with everyone every step of the way. 
because these are all iterative relationships. We don't talk to anybody just once. It's a small world. Word gets out. So with that in mind, that's really our first step. You know, what's the goal we want to achieve? After that, believe it or not, and this comes directly from the investigations my teammates and I used to do, is we use our perceived weaknesses to create our communication strategies, not our perceived strengths. So it can be very easy to go into a conversation and think, well, I've sold X amount of properties worth X amount of value over X amount of time, and I'm very successful and I've made this much money. Therefore, people should want to work with me. They should want to pay me my commission and they should want to do deals with me, whether they're with my organization or not. There is a terribly, potentially, potentially painfully honest factor that we often overlook people have far more motivation to take care of their own self-interests than they do to want to do anything for or with us, especially if there's a, not already a strong relationship in place. Say, say that one more time. People have far more motivation to protect their own interests, to protect themselves than they do to work with us or do anything we want them to, unless there's already a strong relationship in place. Yep. I, I just wanted you to repeat that because that's a powerful statement. Well, I appreciate it. And so with that, here's the first preparation question we ask ourselves. I don't ask myself, why should somebody do what I want them to? Because when I ask that question, I'm trying to focus on their perspective, but I'm transposing my perspective onto them. I'm really looking at this through my lens. So instead, I ask the opposite. Why shouldn't they do what I want them to do? Like from their mind, what are all the things that may be going on in their world? What are their experiences, th viewpoints, perspectives they may have that may not want, that may cause them not to want to do what I want them to do? Then I'm, because I'm kind of a caveman, I'm actually going to write those down on a piece of paper, old fashioned style with a pen. And once I have those all lined up, I'm gonna put them on the left-hand side of the page. I'm gonna draw a line and on the right-hand side of the page, now I'm gonna write down all the reasons why I think I can use that to my advantage. So if these are all the reasons why I think somebody might not want to do what I want them to do from their perspective, now, how do I change the conversation logistically from the topics for the word choice I use, the questions I ask, the order of the questions I ask, all of these things. So it's not about being negative or expecting failure. It's about fully embracing our perceived weaknesses in order to build stronger communication strategies and create unexpected advantages. I'll pause there in case you have any questions. And then there's a couple more things I can mention too. Keep, keep going. Cool. So the next thing that we do that is really important is let the conversation come to you. All too often, people in any type of position of authority or, or expertise can get really tempted to chase the conversation down. Let's hurry up, let's get to the point. Here's what I want, here's what I need, here's where we need to go. It's like a reverse magnetic effect. It's like me trying to get my dog in the house when I let her outside at night. If I go towards her, she's gonna turn around and run away because she thinks this is a game. So for me, it's all about maximizing intelligence, not information. I wanna get out of that check the box mentality and get away from the standard answers I need. How many bedrooms, how much property, what kind of school system, what kind of commute, like these basic questions that we might be asking, which it's good to know, but that's check the box. I'm listening for the nuances, the intelligence in this conversation that can really help me identify, create a relationship with somebody in an unexpected way. So one of the best ways to build a trusting relationship with somebody while gathering this extra intelligence is to let the conversation come to you. Believe it or not, great leaders, great sales professionals, great realtors, they're supposed to be experts. It's really hard to demonstrate expertise if we ask people, I love air quotes, it's really hard to, to prove to somebody that we're an expert if all we're doing is asking questions. Because if all we're doing is asking questions, that means we don't have any valuable information to share. So we like to use a, I steal a phrase from my interrogation background, illustrate before you investigate. I want to illustrate understanding. I want to illustrate expertise in a way that's not bragging, in a way that helps build a, a bond here that then sets up not a lot of questions, but a short number of strong thought-provoking questions that get the information I really need. So once we engage in the conversation, it's all about being patient, letting the conversation come to us and not interrupting people. I don't know that this is still true. I, I read something that I believe the rules have changed. 
there is a little pub in a little town in England, and I'll get you this information if you want it. The names are escaping me at the moment. And every year, pre-COVID, like everything else, they held the world's best liar competition. <laughs> and people had five minutes to spin a yarn. And whoever was voted the best lie wins a trophy and probably free beers, because where else to have a best liar competition than a pub, right? Mm -hmm. This may have changed, but at one point, the groups of people that were not allowed to participate included lawyers, um, professional salespeople, realtors, politicians, there was a few more. I think That's it might hilarious. just be politicians and lawyers aren't allowed to anymore. But at one, at one point, realtors weren't allowed to participate. Now, I'm, I'm sure they wouldn't allow professional interrogators to participate either. Right. So one of the things that especially we all think of ourselves as good people. We all think of ourselves as looking out for our clients' best interests, want to find win-win deals, want to make everybody happy. Unfortunately, and this is more so true for me coming from the world of investigations, people don't off the bat always have the best mental model or expectations for our worlds. Like, is a realtor really looking to do what's best for me? Or are they really looking to maximize their commission and get on to the next? And that's not an insult to anybody, but we can't control the purveying stereotypes about our industries. What we can control is how fast and how quickly we work to violate those expectations, to act in a way that is above and beyond what people expect. There are three different research studies that came out in the early 2000s, maybe mid 2000s, that show we're capable of judging somebody's trustworthiness just by looking at their face in 100 milliseconds. We're capable of judging somebody's trustworthiness just by hearing their voice, it gets a little better, in 500 milliseconds. And we're capable of filing somebody, classifying them inside our previously existing mental models as fast as 150 milliseconds. So people are going to perceive how we communicate with them as proof for how much we respect them. If we can pause, create our strategy based on our perceived weaknesses, initially engage in a way that violates their expectations, let the conversation come to us and ask a fewer number of questions, but greater quality of questions. Now we should be putting ourselves in a much better position to get the intelligence we really need to reach the short-term and long-term goals that we have. So I wanna go back to, uh, that's all very interesting and, and insightful. Um, but I want to go back to something that you said, which was essentially that, you know, let's just use an example of a potential customer, whether that's, a, you know, a, a buyer and you're, you know, telling them why you should be their agent or really more importantly, a listing presentation, right? Um, the way that I heard you describe it was that we should go in and we should essentially uh, lead with, you know, the value, lead with me basically selling ourselves then get to the questions, which kind of goes against what other people teach when it comes to relationship skills or making people feel comfortable, which is shut the hell up and let the customer talk and then ask poignant questions that make them feel good about themselves and allow them to talk about something that's interesting to them, right? Now, that might be a little bit different than actually going into a presentation, but I would argue, and I, I, I'm, at, I'm saying this because I want to hear yeah, your rebuttal, please. that if I go into a listing presentation and sit down at you know John and Mary's couch, and maybe I did a little homework, maybe I didn't, but either way, maybe I was perceptive when I walked in the house and I see they have pictures of kids on the walls. I'm typically, this is just my style, I'm gonna immediately lead the conversation into personal. And I'm gonna ask questions because it's gonna really make them feel warm and fuzzy. Um, and then I'm gonna figure out as they're talking how I can relate it back to myself to then bring a connection. Then I'll go in for the kill on the business because now I've established a relationship. What you said is kind of different than that. And obviously it's a different, totally different perspective, but how would you respond to that? Because I do believe that a lot of people in our industry are taught something similar. And what you're saying kind of goes against it. So explain. Yeah. And, and I would say kind of, it doesn't go totally against it. The, the, the logic behind what you're saying makes entire sense. 
with potentially one very important predicate assumption, which is people want to give you the information you're asking for. So if we're going to sit down with a complete stranger on their couch in their house and just assume that we can start asking them questions and they want to give us this information, then go ahead and do it. But how many times if we don't have a relationship, like maybe you had a really strong referral. So you probably can get away with, I don't want to say get away with that. You're more likely to be more successful if you had a strong referral or a previous relationship or something like that. Yes. But lacking those things, we're a stranger. Yeah. We're a stranger in their house, asking them about very important personal information in their life, likely at a very stressful moment in their life, where if it's a husband and wife and there's children, there could even be stress in the relationship about the decisions that they're starting to make. And we sit down and start asking them questions out of the gate. At the, oftentimes at the beginning of the conversations, people's resistance is at the highest. And it might not be like outgoing, I'm not talking to you resistance, but it could at least be that guarded skepticism, feeling vulnerable. I'm not sure what to say because I'm not sure A, what's important and B, what you might use against me. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna answer you respectfully, but I'm gonna be a little bit careful with what I give you because I wanna be ready for what you give back to me. So that ties into the illustrate before we investigate model. And one of the things that's very important with that I don't know with, with what, what you've studied, I'm happy to send you some links in your audience. I highly recommend devouring every word that Robert Cialdini has ever written about persuasion. His last name is C-I-A-L-D-I-N-I. -I -I. Um, the two books that I would recommend are Influence the Psychology of Persuasion and Persuasion. His first and, and most recent book are the ones I would really recommend. Um, but essentially, there's seven automatic mechanisms of persuasion that kind of lie dormant in our brain until they're awakened, and then they can lead us to accepting outside ideas that we wouldn't normally accept. There's your 30-second synopsis of one man's lifetime worth of work. Um, <laughs> but there's one thing we can do that I believe at least invokes four of them. When we illustrate before we investigate, we should not be using the word you. Because if I was to sit down and I was to say, hey, Jeff, I really appreciate you reaching out to me. I'm sure as you consider selling your home and you consider purchasing a new home, there's many goals and motivations that are driving you, but you probably have some fears and some concerns as well. And my job is really to learn what your fears are and what your motivations are in order to get you a top dollar for this home and get you into the best home possible on the other end. That feels good to us. But every time we say the word you, we Which are about poking six or seven times there. And we're poking them right in their self-image at a moment in time where they potentially feel stressed and vulnerable. So we're potentially offending their self-image. And I say potentially. And at the same time, we're not doing anything to build the perception of our credibility. Because as I say, you, 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 this is clearly a singular conversation. But now if I come in, you know, they welcome me into their home, we get all the initial pleasantries out of the way, they offer me a cup of coffee, we sit on their couch, here we go. Now, if I lead it off with something along these lines, Jeff, thank you so much for inviting me into your beautiful home. I really appreciate it. From my experience, especially at this point in the process, couples who are looking to transition out of one home and into the next, especially with young kids, have many different motivations and also stresses that they're trying to balance as they figure out the best way to navigate the process in order to get from where they are to where they want to be as smoothly and successfully as possible because experience has probably taught them there's going to be issues that they likely never even thought of. So really what my role in this, beyond figuring out if this is really a, a good match for both of us, is to understand what are some of those goals and interests and in, in, concerns as well that are likely shared across many of the people that we've worked with. So I can think back to my experience, talk about some ways on how we can try to alleviate those concerns together, anticipate some of the surprises and get through this as quickly as possible. So the first question I have is, so now as I'm explaining this in, the, in a plural sense, I'm referencing my previous experience. I'm not saying you have fears and concerns. I'm saying often at this point in the process, we talk to homeowners that do have fears and concerns. You can palpably see their vulnerability levels start to go down. 
you've been here before, you understand this, you've had these conversations. If other people have shared this information with you, then it must be okay for me to share this information with you. And we don't have, to use the interrogation analogy, the proverbial swinging spotlight over their head where they might feel like they're getting attacked by questions. You know, questions can be perceived as invitations or attacks. We really want them to be perceived as invitations in order to get the information we're looking for. That's interesting. So I wonder how many of you listening right now are going to go back, rewind, re-listen to that again, uh, maybe seven times and maybe even script it out and try to model that. Um, and that's just a, such a minor tweak, a psychological tweak. But you're telling us as an expert that this really has a big impact on how it's received from our customer. Enormous. To the degree that this is a tool that I use in all of my important conversations. If I'm doing any type of investigative interviewing, victim, witness, suspect, if I'm doing candidate interviews for a client, if I'm engaging in any type of business development conversation, any type of negotiation, it's for me half the fun of using these techniques when my wife and I are negotiating on a car or a home or another big ticket purchase is watching my wife roll her eyes out of the corner of my eye because she knows exactly what I'm doing. This, this piece, and again, we call it illustrate before you investigate is critical. And there's um, research from the sales field completely independent that supports it as well. If I recall correctly, it's the Rain Group and in their book, Insight Selling, and I can get you the, the specific names of the two authors, but in their research, they talk about the three steps that we need to follow to truly connect with our customers are resonate, differentiate, and substantiate. So we, first we resonate by demonstrating understanding of somebody else's world which is really what we're doing using the previous technique in a way that doesn't come across as judgmental, assumptive, and doesn't counteract somebody's self-image. Is, is, that, is that another way of saying solving their pain? Yes and no. Um, and I, I would, it's probably a conversation for a whole nother show, <laughs> um, but I would lean towards no, because there are three buying mindsets. People could be in a problem-solving mindset. They could be in a future-seeking mindset or they could be in a currently content mindset. And in a home buying scenario, you could have couples where one person is in two different mindsets, depending on where they are and how they feel about the situation. So that traditional, I need to get somebody to expose their pain. And I'm saying this for effect. I need to get somebody to expose their pain so I can make it hurt just a little bit worse. And then I can show them how I can fix it it's certainly not invaluable. I mean, that's only been taught for maybe a century at this point. I believe the first like sales text was written in 1928 or something like that. I could be wrong. Fact check me on that. But that essential process has been taught for a century, give or take. So we can't, it's not wrong, but it's limited. And so if we're taking this as a numbers approach, you know, I've got to talk to 50 people to get 10 appointments to get two customers then if we're using numbers-based approach and we're not trying to be as successful as possible in every single conversation, it doesn't matter. But if we're taking a value-based approach, the way that we succeed in a value-based approach is by providing unexpected and unsolicited value. And that's not just through our products and services, it's through ourselves. How do we communicate with people? What kind of experience do we create throughout this entire process in order for somebody not just to want to choose to work with us, but especially in your industry to tell their friends and their neighbors and their coworkers that this is the realtor you should be working with? Because correct me where I'm wrong again, I believe referrals are likely the single greatest way for realtors to explain their, their client book. Yeah, 100%. 100%. Well, and I cut you off uh, by, by asking the question about the, the solving the pain. So I didn't know if you were going to continue it down with those three. Um, yeah, I can go back to that. By the way, this is your show, dude. So you cut me off anytime. Uh, no, man, you're the guest. I'm just, here to, <laughs> I'm just here to facilitate and make sure I bring out the best. So when you look at that resonate, differentiate, substantiate, really what it comes down to is showing understanding of their world. It can be their problem, but certainly showing understanding of their world first, because that increases the perception of our credibility then we can go ahead and begin to differentiate ourselves. And then we can substantiate that differentiation at the end. But all too often in sales in general and in your industry as well, 
people tend to start with the substantiate or differentiate right off the bat. Jeff, thank you for welcoming me into your home. This is a great opportunity, especially considering that I've been the number one producer at my company for the last six years, and I have closed deals on X amount of properties, at or above listing price, X percentage of the time. And honestly, I'm the top dog in this town. So you're lucky you got me today. And the added piece at the end is obviously for effect. But now we started off with substantiation. And if there's, if you have shown me no acknowledgement of my world yet, and you basically walk into my house and say, hey, Mike, what's up? I'm the coolest guy you've ever met. Here's why you should listen to me. That's not a great way to start that conversation, but it's, yet it's a way that so many people do. So what we want to do is lead to our best point, not lead with our best point. So if somebody's success, their numbers, the listing price that they typically sell or buy at, if that is what they really want to push somebody off the fence, to get them to sign with them instead of another agent, we don't want to lead with that. We want to lead to that. When we think about persuasion, there's two basic persuasion approaches. I can either start with my point and then defend it, or I can lead to my point and then present it. And there's applications for both. I really struggle to find a good reason to use the first one the vast majority of times. Because when people take a position, they force themselves to defend it, especially if they say it out loud in front of a group of people, but even if they just think it on the inside. So if I come right out of the gate and make a strong point, if that point doesn't land and this person starts thinking that they don't like it, they don't agree with it, they're not sure of it, our brains are wired to listen for information that confirms what we already believe. And our brains are wired to disregard information that contradicts what we already believe. So if I lead off with the point and somebody thinks, ah, I don't like that, they're literally listening to everything else we say to reaffirm why they shouldn't like it. So there's real risk in there. But now if I work my way up to my best point and illustrate why, you know, Again, the third person, what we just did, illustrate our understanding, how we can ask great questions. Really, now what I can do is I can begin to influence how they perceive the big point that I want to make at the end. So it's it's like I'm, you know, again to use sports, it's my home field advantage. Mm -hmm. Do I want to pay the Cardinals in St. Louis or do I want to play the Cardinals in Chicago? Mm -hmm. Well, if I play for the Cubs, I want to play them in Chicago. If I play for the Cardinals, I want this game in St. Louis. So, and I'll let your listeners decide who they're fans of and where they want to be. <laughs> I think they know. <laughs> but so for me, the vast majority of the time, I want to lead to my best point, not lead with it. And I want to influence somebody's perception before I get there so I can be more confident that they're going to perceive it and find the value in it that I'm intending, as opposed to setting off defenses that I might not even realize. Absolutely fascinating. Um, I, I, and I, I'd like to, I'd like to, before we finish, which, which we need to, we need to wrap up, I would like to go deep on a very specific scenario. So again, at the time of recording, you know, we are, and probably will be when this comes out, but we're still in a time where, uh, you know, every home that's listed is, is flying off the market with 10 million offers over, over listing, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so, I think this is more applicable for the agent who wants to either A, become more of a listing agent or B, you know, uh, improve their game, right? Just become better and land more listings. And so I know you've really, you have done this, uh, but I feel like it's been a little bit more general. So if you were talking to average Joe realtor and, and, um, and they just said, listen, just like that company that you described earlier, I want to hire you, Michael, because I just want to be better. And I've got a listing appointment tomorrow and it's, it's a higher price point than what I'm used to. Uh, so I don't have the, the background or the history of selling higher price point homes in my market, but man, I want to, I want to win. And, you know, I want to be able to articulate, um, something to them that's going to differentiate me from Sally, you know, the gal who's on every billboard and on every, you know, every, every for sale sign in that neighborhood. How would you advise that agent to take their, what would you advise them to do with their strategy? 
I know we only have a few minutes left, so I'll, so I'll keep it quick. And again, I'm happy to answer any questions you have. The first thing I would say is life is a series of solvable problems. We can choose to focus on the problem or we could choose to focus on the solution. The fact that Joe has never sold a house at, at this price point, from my mind, is completely irrelevant. Because when you break down what it takes to sell a home, I'm guessing that within a relative margin of reasonable consistency, the process for selling a home is the same. We might feel the pressure is different based on the price point. And there might be some unique aspects in the homeowners who are selling and the potential buyers based on their expectations. Like people who buy at a Mercedes dealership generally have different expectations on how they want to be treated than people buy at a Chevy dealership. But the process of selling a car is the process of selling a car. So really, I would immediately turn the conversation to let's forget about the price because the price is going to create unnecessary stress within us. That becomes an additional variable that we don't need to balance and it's going to cloud our judgment. So let's focus on what does it take to truly connect with somebody, inspire them to say, okay, I'll trust you, let's do this sell that house in a way that best represents their interests and get them into a new home if they're working both sides of the equation, get them into a new home at the same time. That's what we need to focus on. Focus on the process and the result takes care of itself. If we focus on the result and try to work our way back to the process, it can become more difficult. And it's a similar track that we take when I used to teach investigators full time. Well, I've got a $3 million fraud case. Good for you. That's the same process as a $30,000 fraud case. Like there might be some other things that are different in there, but if we're focusing on the $3 million, we're creating additional pressure that's unnecessary for ourselves. And oh, by the way, if we've been working there the whole time while well, $3 million worth of fraud happened, there's another question we may need to ask, but that's after the fact. Mm -hmm. But back to your example. So it really starts with, and I'm stealing this from a former special forces operator that I had a brief moment in time to do some work with. But one of the comp, comp in, um, one of the thought processes that he left me with is the concept of stay within your circle. So let's identify what our circle is. As Joe, the realtor, you've got a chance to sit down with this family. This other woman has her signs all over the neighborhood. Great. Who cares? Don't talk about it. Don't mention it. It's irrelevant for the conversation that we're having on their couch. At the end of this conversation, when I get up off their couch and walk away, what do I want this couple thinking, feeling, and doing? Then based on that, how do I need to communicate with them to inspire them to do that? That's really where I want to be. And I let's put the price aside for a minute. Let's put the fact that we've never worked a, a home of this value aside for a minute, because that is essentially irrelevant. If we're if we are confident in our ability to move a home and we're confident in our ability to identify with buyers and sellers and get them where they need to be, how they need to be there, that's the message to get across. That's good. That's good. Uh, and and uh, just for reference, how many uh, real estate professionals have you worked with? The total number I probably couldn't give you without just making it up. I've worked with three real estate organizations directly and in... Other presentations that I've done, I would guess another dozen or so professionals that I've trained. What industry do you work with most? I'm industry agnostic. So the three categories that I do most of my education with are leadership communication, sales, and candidate interviewing. And I've done everything from transportation to manufacturing and distribution, construction, real estate, higher education, medical. It's, you know, we teach strategic observation and persuasive communication. So as long as somebody isn't 100% surrounded by robots, we've got the opportunity to do some damage. I wouldn't put it past you to have negotiation skills with them too. Um, that's <laughs> awesome. Tell. And so if somebody wants to learn more, they want to, to find more about you, or uh, let's just say it's a broker owner that's listening or a team lead, and they say, you know what, I'd really love to have you come talk to my team sometime. Um, a, do you do that sort of thing? B, where do they find you? A, yes, I do it all the time, and I would certainly appreciate the opportunity and welcome the chance to talk to them. Thank you for asking. They can find more about all of the programs we teach in advisory sessions we lead at Inquasive.com. So that is I-N-Q-U-A-S-I-V-E.com. If they'd like to connect with me personally, really the only social media I'm on is LinkedIn. 
So they can find me at Michael Reddington CFI on LinkedIn, and I'd ha be happy to connect with them and answer any questions they have. Awesome. Well, you're not speaking a real estate agent's language by saying you're not on social media, but I would say you probably fit the mold because if you'd asked me, which one do you think I'm on? I would have said probably LinkedIn. So you fit that mold very well. Thank you. Uh, Michael, this has been uh, very interesting, very entertaining and very informative. Uh, if, if a realtor listening to this did not gain something from this today, they weren't listening. Uh, and I think this is the type of interview that uh, probably would be even beneficial to go back and listen to it a second time, because, you know, I wish we had more time to go deep on this and even ask some questions. And I'm even going to ask you something off the air here once we finish. Uh, but uh, I, this has been great. I, I appreciate it. I hope the audience has enjoyed this. And uh, go check them out, inquasive.com, I-N-Q-U-A-S-I-B-E.com. Go check this out. It's pretty, it's pretty interesting. There's a ton of services, more than I would have even expected. Uh, I'm going to, I've already stalked the website, but I'm going to go stalk it some more now that I know more. Uh, Michael, this has been great. I really appreciate you being on today. Well, thank you for having me. It's been a real privilege. I've enjoyed the conversation. Everybody out there, stay safe, take care of yourselves, and hopefully we get to do it again down the road. Thank you, man. Agents Podcast.